Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leader series, Innovative Insulated Sandwich Panels, Performance Attributes and Application. My name is Megan Purdy and I'm the Corporate Engagement Manager at Engineers Australia and I will be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our customs, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started today, I would like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Metecno PIR. Metecno is part of the Bondor Metecno Group, Australia's leading manufacturer of insulated wall, ceiling and roof panels. Founded in the 1950s, the group is constantly working on solutions for industrial, commercial and residential building customers across Australia and offers the most comprehensive range of insulated panel products and systems available in Australia. Having operated in the industry for 65 years, Bondor Techno takes pride in being an Australian manufacturer with a full portfolio of products that addresses specific performance requirements, including fire, thermal and spanability. Today we will hear from two speakers followed by our live audience Q&A session and I encourage you to send your questions through to our speakers via the YouTube chat box during the presentations today. I would like to welcome our first speaker, Hamera Arampard. Hamera is a Chartered Professional Engineer with a Civil Engineering degree from Adelaide University. A fellow member of, Engineer, of Engineers Australia, she has over 25 years of experience as an engineer in the building industry, mainly with the manufacturing field as well as consultancy, specifically in airport design and construction. Her specialities include engineering research, product development, technical solutions and advice. She has various diverse projects under her belt from developing websites, e-commerce solutions and engineering software, as well as managing construction projects, process improvement and business integration. Please join me to welcome Hamera Arianpad. Thank you, Megan, for the introduction and good morning, everyone. Today, we go through some of the attributes and applications of insulated sandwich panels. Insulated panels have been used in cold room and freezer applications for many years. And more recently, due to their inherent benefits of energy efficiency, light weight and speed of construction, they've been incorporated into a much wider range of commercial and residential buildings. So we feel it's important to raise the awareness of stakeholders that are involved in the design and use of these products. We'll start by introducing insulated panels. We'll go through some of the benefits and some of the design considerations, and we'll finish off with compliance and spend a bit of time on Codemark certificate. Firstly, insulated sandwich panels with three components, the top and bottom steel skins and the core. In Australia, the skins are mainly made out of blue scope steel, and we have three common core types. Mineral wool made from molten rock, spun into a fiber. Mineral wool is inc increasingly used where non-combustible products are called for, and it is the heaviest out of the three different core types. PIR chars when it's exposed to flame and retains its structural properties for longer. It is formed by a chemical reaction at high temperatures. It has better thermal performance than EPSFR and mineral wool. And then we've got EPSFR, which has a fire retardant additive. And when exposed to flame, it shrinks away from the heat source and self extinguishes. It has been used in Australia since the 1950s. It is 2% material and 98% air, making it the lightest out of the three different core types. There are two main manufacturing processes. The first one that applies to EPSFR and mineral wool is by roll forming the steel skins to the required profile and adhering the skins to the core under pressure. And the second one is a continuous line that forms the skins and expands the PIR foam in between the two skins at the same time. 
Some of the features and benefits of insulated panels consisting of a low to moderate stiffness, low density core connected to the um, thin, stiff exterior skins. The bending capacity is governed by the skins and panel thickness. The shear capacity is governed by the core properties and the thickness of the core. And when combined, you get a product of superior strength, which has a considerably higher properties than an equivalent product made um, of only the core or the skin material. And due to the lightweight and longer span, the overall weight of the supporting structure is also reduced. The insulating properties um, and an airtight panel joint means that you have a light, highly energy efficient building material with good acoustic performance, not to mention the quick and easy installation. After a brief introduction, in this next session, I would like to go through some of the main design considerations related to insulated panels. In most cases, the main property that determines the suitability of a product in a specific application is related to fire. And these are very much dictated by the building classification and the construction type. So let's start with this. You'd be familiar with the different building classifications of the National Construction Code. NCC Volume 1 covering commercial buildings, that is classes 2 to 9, and Volume 2 covering residential building classes 1 and 10. I start with building classification as it influences the technical provisions such as structural fire resistance and so on. An even more important aspect related to fire is the type of construction, which is determined based on the building class and the rise in stories. The higher the building, the higher the risk of fire to health and safety, and the tighter the fire safety measures, with construction type A being the most stringent and C the least. Once we know the construction type, we can look at the fire safety requirements. Clearly today's topic is insulated panels, so we'll focus on NCC's requirements for external and internal wall claddings and roof and ceiling materials. Once we know the construction type, we can start looking at the specific requirements. Type A and B are similar in terms of steps involved and um, in external walls of construction types A and B, they must either be non-combustible um, or have an EW classification when tested to AS5113. And depending on the distance to boundary or fire source, there, there will be some FRL requirements as well. Some of the internal walls of construction types A and B um, need to be non-combustible. And we also need to consider FRL requirements for firewalls and lift shafts. And more importantly, we need to look at the fire hazard properties or group number of all the internal linings. Roof and ceiling claddings of types A and B, they don't need to be non-combustible. And for construction type A, some FRL may be required. And in the case of insulated roof panel, um, if it's also functioning as an internal ceiling lining, we'll need to consider the fire hazard properties as well. Type C, the external walls um, of these types of construction, they don't need to be non-combustible and some FRL may be required based on the building class and the distance to the boundary. Some internal walls may need an FRL and we will also need to consider the fire hazard properties of these linings. Again, for roof materials functioning as ceiling lining, we need to consider the fire hazard properties the same as before. So in these three levels of fire safety measures, firstly, we're trying to avoid the spread of fire to neighbouring property or between different parts of the building. And there are two Australian standards that cover this. AS 1530 part one is the test method used for the dim to satisfy pathway. And for verification method, we can use a product 
that has been tested to AS5113 and given an EW and BB classification. In the first instance, based on the construction type and whether the product is used on the external facade um, or internal walls, and the results of AS1530 Part 1 and 5113, um, you can shortlist the products that might be suitable for your application. Then you need to look at the FRL requirements. FRL requirement is given um, again to avoid um, the spread of fire by shielding the building against fire or um, to separate parts or compartments of the building. To determine the fire resistance level of a system, it needs to be tested to AS1530 Part 4, which provides a set of uniform requirements to determine the fire resistance of a building element. Now, assuming that we have a fire in this third level, we're trying to give the occupant enough time to safely evacuate the building. The 2013 version of NCC used to provide two options for determining group number. Um, namely um, 9705 being the full scale test and 3837 which is by prediction. AS 5637 part 1 was introduced in NCC 2016 and it has two main functions. Firstly to clarify where each one of those two standards can be used i.e. the full scale or the small scale and secondly it clarifies that to determine the materials group number Using the full scale test, the material must be fixed to all three walls and the ceiling. Obviously, these test methods and the passable fire criteria is a whole topic of its own. But today, I just wanted to highlight the overall principle that applies to cladding. And based on the fire properties, we should have a better understanding of which product which uh, will meet um, the fire performance requirements of NCC for each specific project. And the next thing we need to consider is the thermal performance um, and both EPSFR and mineral wool have superior thermal properties. Mineral wool performs slightly better than EPSFR, but EPSFR has been used in the cold chain for many years. And is, um, it is the most economical out of the three options. PIR is around 70% um, better insulated than EPSFR, so we can achieve similar energy efficiency outcomes with a much thinner panel, hence more usable space. The R value of building product is determined in accordance with ASNZS 4859 Part 1, which was released in 2018. So the building class and whether or not the building is to be air conditioned will influence the R value requirements. This building is a good example of multiple classifications with the ma uh, main factory being class 7B requiring different thermal performance than the office building, which is a class 5. Color also influences the energy efficiency of the building and NCC specifies different R values depending on the color and some colors can be used under the deemed to satisfy pathway. In addition to these, we also need to consider the climate zone with different heating and cooling requirements. And to account for this, the energy efficiency provisions vary from location to location. In terms of residential buildings, a big portion of the energy use is associated with heating and cooling. And in 2022, NCC Volume 2 aims to address some of these issues, getting us one step closer to net zero energy. One point that is definitely worth pointing out here is the required R values stipulated in NCC and what is actually achieved in practice. The images here are findings of a research project conducted by the Queensland University of Technology where they looked at 15 traditionally framed homes in southeast Queensland and Townsville to see how the insulation was installed. With the thermal images highlighting the areas of missing insulation in practice. It is important to understand the impact of missing insulation and QUT demonstrated this by looking at the reduction in R values based on the percentage of uninsulated ceiling area. 
which is a real eye-opener. For example, if you're trying to achieve um, R1.5 by taking away just 10% of ceiling insulation, your R value is reduced by 53%. And in reality, you're only achieving an R value of 0.71. This gets worse as your target R value increases. For R4.5, taking away 10% of insulation would reduce your R value by a staggering 76%. So it's not only important to increase the stringency requirements of NCC, but also to promote the use of products such as insulated panel with continuous insulation that doesn't sag or deteriorate over time, so that in practice, you end up with buildings that not only tick the compliance checkbox, but also deliver on the desired energy efficiency. As we can see, there's definitely room for improvement. So we've selected the core and the panel thickness based on fire and thermal requirements. And next we need to look at the structural provisions, which will affect the overall design of the substructure. And of course, the biggest factor affecting the structural performance it is the wind load, which is based on the project location. But when it comes to insulated panels, in addition to wind, uh, we also need to consider the thermal bowing, which is influenced by the temperature differentials, panel thickness, span and skin colour. Indica is going to spend a considerable amount of time on this in the next session, so I won't go through through it here. Suffice to say that it is critical to design the building for panel. By utilising the spanning capabilities of the panel, we can get rid of a massive amount of purlins and gets, greatly influencing the overall cost of the structure as well as the build time. The next aspect of design that I would like to touch on today is the weatherability requirements. Clearly the main objective of this is to prevent the penetration of water into the building that may cause unhealthy or dangerous conditions to the occupants or deterioration of the building. For wall cladding, you can use the verification methods mentioned here on the screen to demonstrate compliance. And for roofing products, we need to meet the requirements of AS 1562 Part 1, which in addition to compatibility of materials, corrosion resistance, fastening, lapping and testing requirements, the standard covers the minimum required roof pitch. We'll go through some examples of these in the next few slides, but rainfall intensity clearly plays an integral part in deciding the most suitable roof system. Another factor influencing the water carrying capacity is the cross-sectional area of the tray. Clearly, higher ribs and wider trays carry much more water. And another factor is the velocity of water generated by the roof pitch on its journey from the ridge to the gutter. A higher pitch may be required for the selected roof profile in areas with higher rainfall intensity. Water ponding also affects the weatherability of roofing and it is caused by either selecting the wrong roof pitch, over spanning the product or um, by the sheet deflecting. Ponding presents potential leaks and the reduction in the service life of the roof, so the minimum roof pitch must take ponding into account. Roof length of the catchment area will also impact the minimum roof pitch requirements. The longer the roof length, the larger the catchment and the larger the volume of water that needs to be channeled through um, the pans. And just uh, as important is the correct location and placement of roof penetration. Placing them at the ridge or head of the roof presents fewer problems because less water will be trapped behind them. Placing them at the lower end of the roof run creates a dam that needs to be diverted to the trays um, on either side. 
One last consideration related to weatherability is the lapping options. Due to manufacturing limits or transport constraints, sometimes it's necessary to install the roof with a joint. So we will now look at the available options. The first option is the sheet to sheet end lap over one purlin using sealant and with or without stitching screws. This is not only prone to leakage due to expansion and contraction of the steel and the sealant losing its effectiveness over time, it can also result in corrosion, which is why we don't recommend it. So let's have a closer look at this one. There are three main concerns with sheet to sheet end lapping. The first, um, as you see here, when the multiple layers of the tape or sealant um, are breached and water becomes trapped in the lap, um, it, with the strong winds, it is actually driven into the building. The second reason is the inability to turn up um, the underlap sheet. As you can see, a repair sleeve has been inserted under the lap to prolong the roof life, but the corrosion will of course continue. And the third reason is the sheet to sheet corrosion. And lap corrosion brought on by the wet dry cycle causing premature failure, which voids the blue scope warranty. Both blue scope steel and Matecno deliver a constant message. You need to understand the risks associated with poor roof design, the warranty implications in relation to premature corrosion failure, as well as the available options, and you need to choose wisely. So let's have a look at the options that we would recommend. Here you see a typical expansion step joint, requiring the upper level purlin cleats to be longer, allowing the upper level roof to overhang the lower roof. This method has served Australia very well over the last 30 years with almost all major shopping centres utilising this system. But we believe the best option is the hybrid lapping system developed by Matecmo. Our secure lap system addresses all the major concerns associated with current end lapping techniques for insulated panel roofing while still allowing connection over one purlin. This system provides watertight security without reliance on sealants. Um, it is suitable for pitches as low as two degrees because it allows um, the lower tray to be turned up, which is vital for water tightness. It overcomes the need for a step in the purlins and it avoids um, any corrosion and doesn't impact on the blue scrape warranty. Clearly, in this short amount of time, we could only touch on some of the more important factors that need to be considered in the selection and design of insulated panels. And next, we'll go through the very important topic of compliance. In Australia, all new buildings and building work must comply with the National Construction Code, which is demonstrated using um, relevant documentation called evidence of suitability. ABCB's handbook provides a framework um, listing various documents that can be used, ranging from product technical statements to reports issued by accredited testing lab and a code mark certificate right at the top of the list. All these evidences are of course valid. However, it's important to note that code mark provides increased consumer confidence guaranteed legislative acceptance by building authorities and saves a lot of time because all the evidence of suitability have already been checked independently by registered qualified professionals. This is an example of one of our code mark certificates for bundle panel. We've been supporting the code mark certification scheme since 2013. We offer the largest range of code mark certificates in our building in, in the building industry and covering insulated panels for walling and roofing profiles in both residential and commercial applications. A code mark certificate is usually several pages long covering a range of information. 
from relevant NCC clauses that are applicable, any limitations and conditions for the use of products, relevant um, technical information, as well as list of documents and evidence methodology. Another point um, worth mentioning while we talk about Codemark is NCC A2.24. Um, as you know, the current NCC was released in 2019 and um, A2.24 was introduced as part of Amendment 1, which came um, out in July 2020. It didn't take effect until July 2021. NCC's performance pathway was introduced quite a few years ago in 1996. However, up until now, there was no defined structure around how this was going to be performed. So as one of the recommendations of the Building Confidence Report, this clause aims to put a uniform structure around the performance solutions. There are four steps to this process. We won't go through these um, in detail, but in a sum um, summary, a performance-based design brief is prepared in consultation with all the stakeholders. The analysis is carried out in step two. This is where the chunk of the work is by collecting all the relevant evidences to show that the product meets the relevant requirements of NCC. The results are evaluated in the next step. Again, this involves a careful investigation, ensuring the documents are valid and current. And the final report is prepared, um, summarizing the whole process. Here we can see the process is extremely simplified using Codemark certificate. The design brief is prepared similar to before, but noting that the intention is to use Codemark certificate to demonstrate compliance. There's massive time saving in the next step because the conformity body that has already undertaken the analysis and all that we need to do here is to check that the certificate um, and ensure that the product meets the required NCC clauses and um, it is used within the limitations set, set on the code mark certificate. Evaluation of the result is also a simple matter of checking Jazzens's website to ensure the code mark is valid. And the final report basically summarizes the above steps. I'd like to point you to ABCB's website for an article that goes through this um, in a lot more detail. They also have a video on their YouTube channel. I've created a QR code for both the article and the video. Um, for your convenience, you can just scan these to access this information. That brings us to the end of my presentation. In the next session, um, Indica will go through a case study which demonstrates how some of the principles I went through here are considered in real life by providing an example of how we push the envelopes to achieve the best outcome for the client. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Homera, for your insights. I would now like to welcome our second speaker, Indica Thilakurantha. Indica is a technical services engineer at Matecno PTY Limited with over 12 years of design and construction experience. Indica is responsible for research and development activities of a range of products, focusing on improving structural and thermal capacities and providing technical support to external projects. He is a former researcher at QUT and consultant for various companies. Indica's expertise include life cycle management of bridges, noise and crash barrier design, facade design, structural design of multi-storey residential and commercial projects, including precast constructions. Please join me in welcoming Indica de la Carantha. I'm Indica, one of the technical services engineers from Metecno. It is a great honor to share our experience with Engineers Australia today. Homila explained about the various applications of sandwich panel products and their performance. So during my session, I'll more focus on the structural aspect of the sandwich panel products. There are around 300,000 small to small to large scale cold storage facilities around Australia. General warehousing and cold storage market in Australia is around 5 billion a year. 
A few major projects are shown, including medium to large scale cold storage facilities that Metecno has recently contributed. One of these facilities are under construction. You may have seen familiar with some of these structures. Cold storage facilities are varying from small scale to large scale depending on their volume. High bees are the biggest member of their family. They can be further categorized as chillers, freezers, etc., based on the, their operating temperature. High bees have over 20 years history in Europe and not in North America. However, this concept is relatively new for Australia. Further, very limited reading materials are available covering design aspect of cold storage cladding. Therefore, we thought it is important to share our experience with you so that we can initiate a conversation. Here, the content is divided into two parts. An overview of the topic, typical cold storage facilities given in the introduction, demonstrating the differences between the typical cold storage and high base. A high base cold storage case study is our main focus in the next phase. Critical factors leading to cut down the construction and life cycle cost of high base are highlighted by using a real life example. Highway cladding design is challenging. We do not have an extra Australian code addressing sandwich panel design. So we refer BACN 14509 for structural design. However, there are some limitations. A few limitations of this code are highlighted in this presentation in order to increase the awareness. Predominant failure modes of cladding and their characteristics are investigated by demonstrating the influences of wind, temperature, and axial load, and construction tolerances. Selection of the fastener materials are also covered. Finally, some of the unique clad detailed requirements for high base are explored. As I am highlighting some unique issues associated with the high B design, the underlying overall cold storage design aspects may not be fully covered in a sequence. This photo shows a typical cold storage facility in Queensland. Some of you may have already familiar with these constructions. I have numbered the main component in a sequence so that you can recognize them easily. The first component is metal wall cladding. This is to prevent direct exposure of the part of the coal through panels to the sun and wind. Supporting steel structure is external and it won't cool down with the freezers and chillers. Therefore, no temperature induced stresses or thermal break through the structural components. Cold room ceilings are supported by roof or load bearing walls. Walls are supported by structural girders or cold room ceiling panels. Fridge ventilators at the top are to minimize the wind loads, especially in cyclonic areas. Freezers are usually located at the middle of the structure to minimize the heat loss. Maximum height of these facilities is generally limited to say 12 to 14 meters, depending on the maximum reachable height of four crypts. These two photos show us two typical single envelope high bay cold storage facilities. High bays can store pallets up to a 40 to 45 meter height. Usually, the, these are fully automated facilities with, with limited human involvement in the pallet storage and retrieval process. Optimized gap between the eyes facilitates the optimum usage of storage capacity. Storage capacity could be increased beyond 50,000 pallets with the high-base system. 
The main difference between the two systems is the way they support the external cladding. The red clad system uses pallet tracking itself to support the external cladding, whereas the cladding is supported by using a space frame system in the second system. There are some advantages and disadvantages in these systems. In a structural engineering perspective, we can identify that the entire structure is assembled on a concrete slab in a red clad system, which distributes the load uniformly to the ground. However, in a space frame system, high concentration of loads are inevitable around the structural columns. Therefore, additional load transferring mechanisms such as piles may be required to transfer the concentrated loads to the ground. In fractal systems, allowable deflection limits are tight. It can be ranged from 1 into 500 to 1 into 1000. These tight limits are to facilitate the fully automated pallet storage and retrieval systems. Consequently, deformation induced stresses on cladding are comparatively limited in red pack systems. The structural deformations are high in a space frame system and higher additional stresses can be expected due to possible structural tolerances and possible foundation settlements. So, space frame systems pose many challenges to the cladding design. Another significant factor is the adverse effect of the wind loads. Adverse effect of the wind loads applied during the construction phase can be managed easily with the high stiffness of the red class systems. However, the wind stiffness are far more severe in space frame systems. You may notice that the steel frame had been strengthened by the cabling system during the construction. One of the main disadvantages of the rectal system is that we can't rearrange the pallet tracking at a later stage. However, with a space frame system, the rearrangement process could be relatively easy. Next, we investigate the external factors contributing to the optimization of the panel thickness. Three major factors are identified, namely geography, building orientation, and skin color. I will explain the influences of these factors by using a high bay cold storage case study. Expansion of a highway project has been selected to demonstrate the significance of those external factors. This facility consists of two stages. Stage 1 is already functioning. Stage 2 construction are highlighted in yellow. Our involvement is mainly with the stage 2 constructions. When combined, this will be the largest cold storage facility in Australia as well as one of the largest in the world. The stage 2 contains 4 to 3 meter high, two freezers running at minus 10 and minus 23 along with the chillers running at 2 degrees Celsius. Another 17 meter high freezer running at minus 2, minus 23 is located at the northeast corner of the building. Single envelope cold storage cladings are highly sensitive to wind and temperature differential. In order to optimize the girder spacing, advantages of the geography and the building orientation need to be fully utilized. The cold storage cladding need to be oriented so that the effect of wind and the temperature are minimized. This case study set a classic example about the utilizing geography and the building orientation. West elevation of the building is subjected to high wind and the temperature due to geography and the orientation. Therefore, the chiller has been located on the west side of the building. Detrimental effect of the wind and the temperature is comparatively low at the east side of the elevation and therefore the freezers are located at the east side of the building. Minus 23 degrees freezer is located at the middle of the building, away from the building corners, 
whereas 17 meter high minus 23 degrees freezer is placed at the front so that it can be partially divert the wind from the north. Usually, the running cost of the cold storage facility is far greater than the cost of construction. Cost of electricity is one of the main components of running cost. Therefore, primary objective here is to minimize the heat loss through the panel thickness. The heat loss depends on the temperature differential of the skins. Darker the skin color, higher the temperature differential. To minimize the temperature differential, lighter colors should be introduced. On the other hand, wind suction is highest at the building corners. This stresses due to wind suction and summer temperature produced worst load combination which usually govern the optimum panel thickness. If the applied stresses exceed the allowable stresses, the countermeasures are very limited. We could either increase the steel thickness or else introduce the ripped skin to compensate the highest stresses. Alternatively, we, we could relocate the colored panel by moving them away from the corners. If nothing works, we have to reduce the span or the girt spacings. Another important factor is the selection of maximum panel length. The maximum panel length depends on the transportability of the panels. Also, we have to consider lifting procedures and capacity of the lifting devices to be used in the installation process. The maximum length also governs by the stress accumulation during the cooling down cycles. Number of stacks need to be determined by considering all these factors. Here we have three stacks. Note that the timeline of completion may influence us by the number of stacks. On the other hand, we have to provide shelf angle at the stack joints to transfer the shelf weight of the panel to girds, which also act as a temporary panel support during the installation. Additionally, we have to flash off the step joints to minimize the thermal break along the panel ends. All these factors must be, must be considered in the design stage. Once we optimize the influences of the external factors, we can step into the design phase. In the absence of relative relevant Australian standard, we have to use European standard BS14509 in the design. However, there are some limitations of this code. So we are going to go through the uh, this limitation in the next few slides. Here I would like to emphasize about the governing equations. I have reproduced one of the tables of this code for clarity. There are six rows covering single sparing applications as well as two and three sparing applications for sandwich panel with plain and lightly propelled schemes. Equations are provided to assess the influence of uniformly distributed loads and the temperature differential under each, each spanning conditions. The effect of temperature differential in single spanning panels only contributes to the panel deflection, that is theta L squared over 8. However, temperature induced loads are more critical in double and multi spanning panels. It contributes to the panel deflection as well as support reaction and bending moments. The temperature induced stresses are directly proportional to the temperature differential between the internal and external panel skins. Theories of simple bending equations are not very accurate sandwich in sandwich panel design, particularly in multi spanning applications. We can identify that the reactions and moments are a function of a parameter called K, which is also known as the shear factor. Shear factor depends on the loading patterns, say for example UDL or point load, etc.
If we assume that the K factor is equivalent to 0.7, for example, we can notice that the bending moment at the internal support will be reduced compared to moment derived based on the simple bending equations. In other words, the stresses derived from European standards are lower than the compared to the that are derived from simple bending equations. Even though BSEN 14509 sheds some light for cold storage design by providing a set of governing equations, there are two limitations. We maintain controlled, controlled environment condition inside the cold rooms at service irrespective of the outer environmental conditions such as wind. Therefore, internal temperature will not be reduced significantly compared to the outer skin condition in an event of such as storm. Therefore, application of standard load combinations as they are in cold storage design is questionable. Say for an example, one of the ordinary load combination consisting of stresses induced by the wind plus 0.6 times the stresses induced by the temperature differential. In an event of a storm, temperature of the outer skin can be reduced significantly and therefore 0.6 reduction factor could be reasonable. However, the same will not be valid for internal skin where it maintains the temperature at this specified limit. So it is reasonable to assume that the combination factor is valid only to the outer skin temperature of the panels. Additionally, effect of the axial load and axial shortening stress are not exclusively covered in the European code. Where the supporting structure is located inside the cold storage facility, the temperature of the supporting structure will be reduced under the cooling down cycles. As a result, the structure will shrink during the cooling down cycles, longitudinally as well as laterally. These temperature induced loads need to be addressed carefully in the structural design of the steel skeleton as well as in the cladding design. Another grey area I see is influences of the possible fastener, de fastener deformation during the cooling down cycles. Panel skin will shrink during the cooling down cycles with respect to each other. Fasteners connected to the panel skin can be deformed as a result of this relative deformation between the skins. Load applied by this external skin on the fastener head is large enough to cause fastener deformation. The resultant bending stresses generated on the fastener could limit their effectiveness against the outward loadings such as wind. We are going to discuss about this effect in the next uh, few slides. Here, the effect of axial shortening during the cooling down cycles are investigated in detail. Typical section of the cold room wall is given at the top. The sandwich panel is fixed to a steel frame. The outer skin temperature is considered at 67.5 Celsius and the inner skin remains an ambient. During the cooling down cycles, inner temperature will gradually drop from ambient to minus 23 degrees Celsius. As a result, the steel frame will shrink along with the internal panel skin. Condition of the outer skin remains unchanged. Consequently, the internal panel skin will apply compressive stress on the outer panel skin by bobbing the panel outwards. Note that the temperature of the structural steel frame at the time of the panel installation significantly influences the amount of axial shortening. If the panels are installed during the winter, the axial shrinkage induced stresses could be minimized. The amount of axial shrinkage can be calculated by using equation given in the axial load versus displacement graph. Wow. 
The axial shrinkage is a function of initial length of the panels and the temperature differential. Procedural stresses in the skins are also contributing to the axial deformation. Magnitude of the axial shortening could be ranged from 4 to 5 mm. The axial shortening will apply an axial load on the panel. Axial load versus displacement for a typical panel is shown in the graph. As you can see, 4 mm axial deformation could generate around 15 kN axial load in the panel. This will be a significant load as far as the remaining panel capacity is concerned. When combined with the thermal stresses induced during the cooling down cycle, the resultant axial stresses could lead to wrinkling failure of the external panel skin or the support as shown in this figure. This figure is uh, reproduced from the famous book titled Light Field Sandwich Construction by Professor Davies. Therefore, cooling down should be performed in stages by allowing panel to redistribute the applied stresses gradually. On the other hand, if the cooling down cycles are performed at, a, at an accelerated rate, it may cause a big failure of the panel skin, especially when the panels are continuous over several supports. How to quantify the additional stresses due to axial shortening? As we know, there are two limit states to be considered in the cladding design, namely ultimate limit state and serviceability limit state. At the serviceability limit state, panels are considered to be continuous over the internal supports. Usually, the wrinkling stress over the brittle support exceeds the allowable stresses, and therefore, serviceability limit state covers the design. Consequently, at the ultimate limit state, we assume that the plastic hinges are formed over the internal support and the calculation becomes simplified to single spanning panels. By assuming that there are no axial loads present, we simplify the load combinations to wind pressure plus winter temperature and wind suction plus summer temperature. This is accurate in the presence of axial loads. Out of these load combinations, wind suction and summer temperature usually govern the design and therefore discussed in detail. At the serviceability limit stage in figure 2, the outer panel skin will, will be subjected to maximum limiting stresses over the intermediate support. The axial loads that are gradually accumulated over the panel length will be shared by both the skin equally at the supports. Therefore, axial stresses are likely to combine with the stresses resulting from wind suction and summer temperature by worsening the stresses at the serviceability limit state. At the ultimate limit state in figure one, effect of the axial shortening is uh, twofold. The axial load N on the panel will apply a direct compressive stresses on the panel skin while acting as a eccentric load. Secondly, the load will generate a compressive stress at the mid-span due to the secondary moments resulting from the load sensitivity and the panel deflection due to the temperature differential. Therefore, axial stresses are likely to combine with the wind suction to enhance the stresses at the ultimate limit state. After describing one of the limitations of the European Court, uh, that is fastener deformation, we will move on to the effect of structural misalignment. Contribution of the wind, temperature and axial loads on wind cleanses are elaborated in the next slide. Subsequently, selection of the fasteners and the corrosion resistance of the structural substrate will be briefly described. The stresses in fastness is another important aspect in cold, cold storage design, which has not been fully covered in European code. 
To demonstrate the significance, I have considered a 5 mm, five meter double spanning panel. Temperature of the steel structure at the time of installation is considered at 55 degrees Celsius. This will result around 4.68 mm axial shortening during the cooling down cycles at the discontinuous end of the panel. We can calculate the longitudinal load to be applied on the screw head in order to deform the head by 4.68 mm. The load will be 15.77 Newton. This load is lower than the bearing stress of the internal external skin and therefore it is reasonable to conclude that the fasteners are tend to deform during the cooling down process. So we can expect around 193 megapascal bending stresses in the fastener material. As a result, effect, effective tensile capacity of the screws will be reduced. Countermeasures that can be taken to mitigate these stresses are limited. In non cold room applications, we usually provide oversized folds on the outer skin to minimize the fastener deformation. However, Effectiveness of the same solution in cold storage application is unknown. On the other hand, oversized hole may reduce the pull-through capacity of the fixing points. Further, increasing the number of fasteners may not be effective beyond four screws per panel, as it might initiate a linking failure of the skin by forming a premature increasing line along the fixing points. Possible support misalignments are often overlooking during the design phase. I have considered a 4.5 meter long double spanning panel to demonstrate the consequences. By assuming that there is a 10 millimeter misalignment in the intermediate support, the stresses generated on the panel skin is calculated. I have used conventional equation just to uh, demonstrate the concept. A point load P applied at the intermediate support by deforming the panel by 10 millimeters. Having calculated the required point load, that is 1.32 kN, I have back calculated the stresses generated by the point load P acting at the mid span. It can be noticed that the stresses generated on the panel skin due to the 10 millimeter misalignment is around 30 megapascal. If we assume that the design capacity of 80 megapascal over the intermediate support, then the effective design capacity of the panel will be reduced by 37%. So this is a significant reduction of the panel capacity. As we discussed earlier, external skin tend to fail over the intermediate support due to combined effect of wind suction summer temperature and axial loads. This failure mode is commonly known as wrinkling failure. The effective wrinkling stress available over the support could be reduced further due to the influence of fasteners or the reaction forces generated by the supports. Let's assume that the allowable wrinkling stress over the submid span is uh, 100 MPa and the reduced wrinkling stress over the support is 80. As shown in the table, two limit states were considered in this analysis. Under the ultimate limit state, panels were treated as single spanning panels. Here, the panels tend to fail by wrinkling at the mid-span due to the effect of wind suction and axial loads. Temperature differential has a negligible effect on the stresses. Required the design capacity at the mid-span is 71.1 MPa. Whereas the allowable capacity of the midi span is 100 MPa. At the ultimate limit state, serviceable, sorry, at the serviceable limit state, the panels are considered to be continuous over the intermediate support. The panels tend to fail by wrinkling over the internal support. Here, a reduction, reduced stress of 80 MPa was assumed to compensate the additional compressive stresses due to the fasteners. The required design capacity, that, that is 128.8 MPa over the support, 
has well exceeded the allowable capacity of atypic Pascal of the panel scheme. Therefore, the panel will be tend to fail over the support at the serviceability limit state. That means continuous panel cannot be used in the proposed uh, application with the proposed cloud spacing. If this pan cannot be reduced, we have to introduce stress cuts to release the excessive stresses over the supports. Here we cut the internal skin of the pan next to a support so that continuous panel will act as a single spanning panels. In order to make sure that the pan act as a single spanning panels, fasteners are provided on either side of the skin cut as shown in the figure. As a result, point of maximum stresses will move towards the mid-span by reducing the required design capacity from 128.8 MPa to 71.1. This will provide an additional buffer of 30 MPa against failure. With the buffer, additional stresses due to misalignment of the supports are no longer critical. Also, stress accumulation on the fastness due to continuity of the panel can be greatly reduced. However, we have to keep in mind that stress cuts may produce some installation challenges that must be considered, especially if you use conventional lifting equipment like flat boys. In conventional cold storage applications, we usually use mushroom boards for panel fixing. High pull-out and pull-through capacities as well as insulated mushroom head make them ideal for cold storage applications. The challenge we faced in the high bay cold storage is that there is no access from inside to assemble these mushroom connections. Additionally, thickness of the substrate is quite high and therefore hard to drill for 10 millimeter diameter mushroom boards. Similarly, carbon steel fasteners pose a unique set of issues in cold storage applications. High PMT of the supporting structure may distort the fastener heads during installation and once the base material is exposed, the carbon steel is acting as a sectional material. Therefore, we used stainless steel fasteners in the high bay application. In the presence of stainless steel, the structural steel work and the panel skin themselves become the sacrificial material. However, as the ratio of the carbon steel to stainless steel is low, the effect of corrosion on the steel structure and the panel skin become negligible. Additionally, thermal conductivity of the stainless steel is one third compared to that of the carbon steel. As we have to use thousands and thousands of screws in the highway projects, mitigation of thermal break through the fastness is paramount. Salt and industrial pollution significantly increase the conductivity of the water. So galvanic effects are more severe near the coast and heavy industrial areas. When the polluted moisture accumulated around the screw heads, the panel skin become more reactive compared to the rest of the structure and may tend to corrode at an accelerated rate. Therefore, due diligence must be paid in application across the marine and industrial environments. Additionally, it is important to use post galvanized steel section or post painted sections with sink rich industrial coating system in sandwich panel applications in order to avoid corrosion in the O-line panel scheme. Finally, some of the preliminary detailing requirements are briefly discussed within the given time limits. A few critical detailing requirements are illustrated. As shown in figure one and two, it is quite important to use RSH or SHS at the wall to roof or wall to wall intersections to avoid complications. By introducing 
cross sections, integrity of the joint can be easily maintained while internal corner flashing could be avoided. Opening up of the pad joint at the wall to wall intersection around the mini span was one of the main design considerations. To avoid this, fasteners to be provided at a closer spacing as shown in Figure 2. RSH and SHS can facilitate frequent fixings while meeting the required stiffness, stiffness at the intersections. Another important consideration is the step joints and shelf angle as shown in Figure 3. There are many differences, different alternatives used in the industry, including L angles directly fixed to the substrate. However, by providing a self supporting angle, a lot of labor hours can be saved. Note that there should be some gaps between bottom panel and the shelf angle in order to facilitate the panel installation and the thermal expansion. This gap must be filled with polyurethane sealant at a later stage to avoid thermal break. Notches on the external flashing will allow absorption of thermal movement at the panel joint without applying additional stresses on the external skin fixings. It is also important to note that all the through fixed screws are made of stainless steel, whereas skin fixed screws are made of carbon steel. These details are accurate to the best of our knowledge, but there could be some uh, limitation when it comes to the uh, individual applications. Therefore, further improvement should be warranted. In summary, I have briefly covered some of the design aspect of cold storage facilities by using a case study. Hope that you have a better understanding about the cold storage cladding design. In a structural point of view, cladding design is one of the key elements which need to be carefully addressed in, the, in order to optimize the structural design of cold storage. Usually, we are in continuous contact with the project architects and the design engineers at the initial stage of these projects to resolve project specific issues and to investigate the most feasible solution. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Indica, for your insights today. Now, our speakers will come together to take questions from you, our audience. If you would like to submit a question, please do so via the chat box. And I can already see that quite a few questions have come through. But please remember uh, to provide your name and who your question is for. Now, we have received some questions on registration, so I might begin today with some of those. Uh, and I may direct my first question to you, Hamera. Um, how are ISPs looking to maximise use of recycled material or incorporate other sustainability initiatives? And that question is from Robert in New South Wales. Thank you, Robert. That's a very good question. Um, well, the panel itself um, can obviously be recycled and reused. Um, however, if you're talking about um, its end of life, um, there are two main components, the steel skin and the core. Um, the steel is theoretically 100% recyclable and um, Blue Scope is, of course, um, committed to sustainability and we can refer to their website to find out um, the exact recycled content. Um, but then if you're looking at the core, um, currently it's being recycled into other products. Um, however, we are working on a major project right now with Melbourne University on how we can use recycled core back into our production and potentially um, even improve the mechanical and fire performance of the core um, at the same time. Excellent. Thank you. Um, now, the next question, I might direct this one towards Indica, and it's from Gregory, uh, Gregory, I should say. Now, he has asked, can you please comment on the structural stability of insulated panel in fire? And there were a few questions which came through on the fire topic. Um, so I will get to, get to them during the day, but the first one for you, Indica. Did you want me to go through that again? 
yeah, uh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, so uh, we have different core materials available, uh, namely EPSFR and PIR and mineral wool uh, for your applications. The first thing is uh, we must choose the uh, right product uh, for the right applications. Uh, for example, similar to timber, uh, PIR charts when it is uh, explored to uh, flame, which means it maintains its structural properties for a longer period of time. Uh, so mineral walls are for FRL applications and depending on the construction method and the installation technique, we can achieve uh, up to 180 FRL. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, insulated sandwich panels are generally using uh, non-load bearing applications and they are secured to the structural members with the uh, fasteners. Uh, so the structural stability of the building is uh, not a big concern during a fire. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Indika. Uh, Himera, I've got a question from Jimmy in WA and still on the sustainability type topic. And his question is, can sandwich panels be incorporated into residential home construction for environmental sustainability? Again, another good one. Um, yes, they can and they are. Um, in fact, we have two different residential solutions. Uh, we have the insul living system, we have the lux wall system, and this is an area that we're very passionate about and putting a lot of resources into. Uh, we were involved with QUT um, on a few projects. In one of my slides, um, you might recall, I showed the thermal imaging from one of their studies that um, highlighted the problems with the current building practices when it comes to energy efficiency. Um, in another very interesting study, QUT monitored one of our insulin living houses for 12 months while uh, there was a family of four who, who were living in it. They were monitoring the outside temperature and that was using a weather station that was placed on the roof of the house. Um, they were monitoring the in, um, inside temperature and their energy use. Um, and in practice, they achieved nine and a half stars. Um, and with a five kilowatt uh, PV system, they would achieve um, net zero energy. So that's during occupancy. But if you want to consider sustainability as a whole, um, insulated panels are much quicker to build. Um, the external and internal cladding and insulation are all in one, which in turn reduces the number of deliveries to site, um, the number of trade people and, um, and the build time. Um, so both during construction and occupancy, it makes a um, massive contribution to sustainability. Some, some definite benefits there. Um, Indica, I've had a couple of questions come through. Um, one on our uh, questions from registration and also one yeah. which has come through live. And yeah. they're all about, um, does the design of roof panels consider hail and water Bonding loading through roof panels. And then the second part to the question is, and this one's a live question from Neil, how is the lifespan of these panels affected by hail damage, even where the hail does not penetrate the other skin? Um, yeah, again, a good question. Uh, so yes, there's, uh, first, uh, if you uh, uh, think about the water, uh, uh, the water ponding, possibility of water ponding is uh, relatively limited uh, due to the high stiffness of the sandwich panel when compared to the single, uh, single skin products. Uh, uh, but when it comes to the hail damage, uh, we better uh, refer to the blue scope uh, technical bulletins. So we can expect uh, like a minor dents due to uh, hail. However, there's no concern about this. Uh, structural performance of the sandwich panel due to hail. Uh, if the dents are significant, significantly large, then uh, we can expect some uh, possibility of a, like a long-term corrosion due to water and uh, dirt accumulation. Uh, however, there's a loss of, uh, loss of pain due to hail is not a significant concern of uh, 
uh, structural point of view, it is only a, like a aesthetic appearance concern. So, in other words, uh, loss of paint uh, have no significance on the corrosion performance of the color burnt repainted uh, panel screens. Thank you. I think I addressed your question. Thank you. I think you did. Um, Hamira, I've got a, another question, fire related, um, and this came from Jeffrey in Victoria. And his question was Would you please comment on the fire performance of the ISP core material? In particular, are any toxic combustion products evolved or maybe involved? <laughs> um, yep. Um, basically, all fires generate smoke and toxic gas. And um, toxicity is a complex subject, um, only to a certain degree it's related to the material properties. It's influenced by the environment, um, availability of oxygen, thermal attack, um, airflow and um, a whole lot of other things. But um, the most important point that um, we need to recognise, and this is based on independent studies, is that um, the vast majority of the smoke and toxic gas is actually generated by the burning contents of the building. In fact, in the case of um, insulated panels, um, the panels are not significantly affected until um, the fire is fully developed. And then even if you look at the mass of the material in the panel, they're very small compared to um, the burning mass in the building. So I guess um, um, concerns about toxic gas and smoke emissions um, from the panel must be put into context um, compared to the toxic emissions from other building elements. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Indica, I have yeah. a question. It's a live question which has come through from Jeff Andrews. Thank you, Jeff. And his question yes. is, which is the best SIP profile for attaching solar panel framing without penetration? That is, is there a profile with ridges suited to plants rather than through bolting? Yeah, um, the, um, we have uh, basically rip profiles and core graded profiles panels for roofing applications. So depending on the, the profile shape and size, we have uh, different uh, PV bracket systems specified for each uh, at, for different uh, panel types. So we have uh, tested those uh, bracket capacities for on our panels and in our lab. So we have that uh, certified capacities for uh, different bracket types. So they don't need uh, true fixings. So if you can pass us some uh, project specific details, uh, then we can provide uh, those uh, information and fixing capacity and all, all those uh, fixing details. Thank you. Thank you. Mira, there are a couple of questions came through on um, acoustic performance. Um, so I'm hoping you could just, um, just comment upon uh, the acoustic performance on the ISPs, please. Sure, we didn't really cover that much um, during the presentation. Um, there are basically two components to acoustic performance. Um, you've got the sound absorption and insulation. And um, in terms of absorption, um, because insulated panels have a smooth and a hard steel um, surface, um, they tend to reflect high frequency, uh, frequency sound and if this is a problem, obviously it can be improved using sound absorbing materials such as curtains and carpets which are commonly used um, to reduce sound reflections in, in all applications. Um, but if we look looking at the sand insulation which um, refers to the ab ability of the material to stop or reduce transmission of sand, um, generally, you need denser materials with higher mass um, to um, offer improved sand insulation. And considering how lightweight they are and um, the ease of construction, insulated panels provide good acoustic values. Depending on the core type, um, you might get an RW of between 24 to 30. And um, another important factor to keep in mind is the proper installation of the wall or the roof system that you're using to minimize noise transfer through gaps or flanking paths. 
and clearly with um, continuous insulation and airtight joint um, insulated panels reduce flanking paths so the theoretical comparison of insulated panel with conventional building materials is likely to appear less favorable than what would actually be um, experienced in practice however if you require higher values than the ones i mentioned for your project we can look at various systems to achieve higher values Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Indica, I'll, um, I'll throw to you now. Uh, the question is, and it, it's come from Scott in South Australia, uh, are there oh. panels suitable for use in power generation applications, that is gas or diesel generator enclosures for the noise? Uh, yeah, I've been... Uh, uh, Good question. Uh, so, so we need. I think we need a little bit of a more information uh, about these applications uh, because it's, if it is a like a uh, noise attenuation kind of thing, so it's a not a big concern. But uh, if there's any FRL rating is required, or there's any uh, gas gaseous uh, the panel exposed to gaseous environment then we might have to think about the chemical reaction with the gases uh, gases with the panel core and the, of course with the ex ex external steel skins so then uh, then only we can uh, make sure that we recommend the right products so we need some uh, more information i guess and then uh, please drop us an email and or just uh, contact us with the project information thank you excellent thank you um, Mary, there was a question which came through, and I know we've spoken about um, using the product in, in houses, um, but this one is um, from Arsenal, and his question was, are these um, panels, can they be used in freestanding houses, duplex, townhouses? But then he goes on to ask, are they approved by Building Australia? Um, do they provide similar protection as double brick walls? Okay, a few questions there. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, they can be used um, in freestanding applications. Um, we, as mentioned before, the insulin living, as you rightly mentioned, um, it's a unique system. Um, we utilize the maximum capacity of sandwich panels to provide a freestanding structural system. The system can be used up to two stories. Um, for two stories and duplex houses, we will need um, some structural support for the floor, obviously, party walls and around larger openings. Um, otherwise, the rest of the system um, can be built more or less um, as a freestanding system. And the system has been independently certified and we have a code mark certificate as well, um, which can be used um, to simplify the compliance pr uh, process. Well, thank you. There were a, a few questions around, and I'll, I'll direct them to you both, um, around, uh, well, one was, what are the technical details related to the structural shear capacity of the sandwich panel when used as a bracing element? And another question, are they load bearing? So maybe Indica, did you want to answer those ones or speak um, to those? Yeah, yeah that's a... Uh, uh, when it comes to the shear capacity of the sandwich panel elements uh, and uh, bracing capacities, um, yes, yes, sandwich panel products can be used as a bracing elements and the bracing capacity of the walls and the, especially the diaphragm capacity of the roof can be used to stabilize the external structure. Uh, uh, however, there are a lot of uh, details to explain and then uh, the fixing details need to be done and then uh, uh, is is with uh, uh, within this time limit maybe it's a bit difficult to explain everything. So, but uh, we are happy to provide all those information. They are available uh, with the technical, uh, and then uh, please drop us an email, and we can provide all those uh, 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 information. And when it comes to the the load bearing of the panels. Uh, Yes, they can be used in uh, load bearing applications. Uh, typically, uh, like I say, for a, th a three meter high wall, could carry around eight kilonewton per meter 
a load depending on the nature of the load say for example static load and uh, of course the load is centricity and uh, uh, but the issue here is we have to adjust the out of plane bending capacity uh, of the panels depending on the magnitude of the axial load and the load is centricity so we can provide certified loading charts uh, and upon request and always we can provide design guidelines which based on uh, project specific uh, requirements uh, if you can pass other uh, the exact information you want thank you no well thank you for that um we may have already asked or answered this question but mira how can this system be applied to class two buildings no we haven't actually um well um <laughs> class two buildings <laughs> um it depends on um a whole lot of things um if if it is um construction type a construction type b um, depending on the rise in stories um, how close to the boundary it is so basically it depends on a whole lot of things on the fire requirements whether you need a non-combustible um, walling or not if you need non-combustible walling then uh, we would probably recommend a flame guard panel um or um we also have that's if you want to go to deem satisfied pathway um or we can also offer um the cassette system which has been tested to as5113 and uh, been given ew and bb classification um so it really depends on on the application and whether it's a construction type A or B. And if you're using it on the external cladding, roofing, um, we, I really need a little bit more information to be able to, um, to, to answer that question. Oh no, thank you. Um, we're coming very close to the end, but there was an interesting question which came through from Tyler in Victoria. Um, and I'll ask this one to you, Indica. Has the application of these sandwich panels been explored for precast flooring? If not, why not? Um, yeah, we, we uh, actually we have a system uh, for which is very similar to the uh, precast uh, sandwich construction. We are we have a sandwich uh, PIR core uh, between two. Uh, concrete panels so that's uh, so that's the, the that this system we already have and also we used uh, EPS products under the uh, as a pro insulation in uh, in the cold room applications so this is uh, this typical these are the typical applications we have at the moment so uh, yeah um, we have those systems and we can improve further we, there are some rules for improvement but yeah we have the already system in place excellent thank you very much look i am i, I do have to apologize to everyone i think we have uh, run out of time there are so many questions um coming through um but that is all the time that we have for today so please join me in thanking our speakers mira and Indi and Indica for their time and insight shared at today's session. I would also like to thank Engineers Australia's industry partner, Bondor Matekno, for making today's webinar possible. And we would appreciate your feedback on our program today to help us to improve and plan for future sessions. If you could please complete the short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below. Thank you again for joining us. And we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you.